Morning. Love y'all too. Aren't you thankful for our band? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder of reverence. We thank you for the reminder of your holiness. Lord, I'm thankful for the reminder that no one can approach you without being covered by your son's blood. Lord, I pray you don't wait for people to get saved at the end of service. I pray you just speak to their hearts now. May they desire to repent and call you as Lord. Lord, I give you my fear in that yucky flesh stuff that stirs up. Fear of not knowing what to say or not knowing what to do. What if this happens? What if that happens? Lord, I just give you all that junk. You can give it to you. You died for preachers who mess up. Father, help us represent you well today, not just giving and declaring your word, reading your word, but receiving your word. Lord, I'll echo what Pastor Dwayne said about those in the storm last night. May you comfort them where they need comfort. May you help them where they need help. And may you let us know if you want to use us as the hands and feet of your body. Amen. Lord, we love you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Memorial. The Lord gave me a heart to see things in person, but then to find it somewhere in the Bible. Thank you, Becca. Find somewhere in the Bible where we can talk about it. I think Jesus, and I don't think I know Jesus. He did that as well with parables. He would say, you see that over there. You understand that. The kingdom of heaven is like. And so I believe the Bible where it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he still does that, speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Raise your hand if you're born again. May we exercise our faith in public and get used to declaring that, not shine away. He said, the word says, I take no pleasure in those who shrink back. And this is not a white knuckle thing, a cowboy or cowgirl thing. This is a submission Holy Spirit thing admitting that we can't without him, and then he fills us with boldness. But uh, a few statistics first. Um, saw a survey yesterday that surprised me. If you've heard me say a few times from the pulpit, let us not all as born-again Christians assume everybody knows what we know. And if the Holy Spirit inspires us to say something to somebody, don't let this thought stop you from saying it. Surely they know that. I don't need to say that. May you say it anyway. But this recent survey said that 46% of Americans do not know what Memorial Day weekend is about. They don't even know what it's for. And it's turned into just uh, barbecues and, and just an extra three-day weekend. But where did it start? It started with the Civil War. And uh, 600 plus soldiers, uh, the North and the South combined, 600,000 plus soldiers died during the Civil War. Um, and then obviously after that, um, they were inspired to make a national cemetery. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Arlington. It's absolutely gorgeous. It, uh, you know, this is where I don't know if I'm getting to be an older man or or the Lord just through the sanctification process makes your heart a little more tender. But when you walk through that cemetery, you can't help but resurrect gratitude and appreciation and what it means to honor. And I said the first service, I'll say it this service as well, because it's still ringing in my heart. You know, there's many things that the Bible says a Christian should be and the fruits of the Holy Spirit and all these things. But um, I pray that your prayers, along with my prayer, is that Jesus teaches us how to honor each other more. Um, it is a beautiful thing to honor each other. And, uh, you know, even if you don't speak another person's language, they can tell if you're respecting and honoring them. And I think that speaks volumes. And so my wife and I got to go to D.C. one year. It was for her work, um, and I just got to go with her. 
But while we were there, we got to visit a few monuments, a few memorials. Uh, one of them was um, the World War II memorial. She took a picture of the state she was born in, the Missouri part. I got to take a picture in front of Texas. And um, we got to also see the Lincoln Memorial, the Vietnam Veteran Memorial, the Wall, the Korean War Veteran Memorial. They even had a law enforcement. I know Memorial Day is for those who have been in the United States military service and have died while being a soldier. Is there um, any Gold Star families here today? There was a Gold Star family in the first service. Where? God bless you. Um, what that means is during World War I, um, I think it's good to know history, um, mainly so we don't repeat the silly mistakes we've made in the past and think that we're something smart and we got something new. The book of Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun and everything that has been done will always be. But in World War I, um, for a family that would have um, people in their family uh, across seas and fighting the war, um, they would have blue stars. And if any of those family members did not return and they died in combat, they would change the blue star to a gold star. And so if you ever see, you think veterans get excited when you say, appreciate your service, you imagine what a gold star family would do if you saw that a sticker on the back of their vehicle. Sometimes there's license plates. And especially at home, maybe on the porch, if you know they're a gold star family, be sure and love on them because they had a family member that died um, the other one was uh, that we went to see the law enforcement more memorial, and I know that that's not military, but they have a male lion statue and a female lion statue, and they have scripture on this memorial. It's for every police officer that ever died in the United States of America. Texas, you know what Texas means? The friendly state come from the Tejas Indians, um, but Texas is one of the most dangerous states to be a cop. The memorial. Texas, California, and Florida. Anyway, the, at the, the scripture on the, the memorial, it says, the wicked flee when no one pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And I pray that Christians today become that as well, is that um, we don't run from things, um, even though our flesh wants to sometimes. And I pray that we become bold. And this is, again, I can't emphasize this enough. This is not a white knuckle thing. This is an immediate submission to the Lord and saying, Lord, forgive me for being a coward. And would you fill me up with your fire and your boldness? And God will answer that prayer. He loves to answer that prayer. If you believe that, say amen. amen. I'm just going to jump into it. Um, memorial. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3. What does the Bible say about not necessarily Memorial Day, but where God said this is a memorial? A memorial is obviously something to remember a person or an event in life. And after I got to studying about memorial throughout the Old and New Testament, because it's mentioned in both, you will see that God is all in the business of honoring people and honoring his name. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So where in the world would God first set his first memorial up? In Exodus chapter 3, let's start at verse 13. Um, but before I read, just to let you know, in case you don't, that if the Holy Spirit's inspiring you to do something, he's been prompting and pricking your heart to do something for him, whatever it may be, no matter how crazy it sounds, just know that Moses argued with God for about two pages in the Bible, and that's little print, so he argued a whole bunch, right? <laughs> and Moses became a very powerful man of God for the Israelites in the kingdom of heaven, Matter of fact, uh, Moses said, God will raise up a prophet like me. And there's many types and shadows between Moses and Christ. And um, so as we read, this is Moses finally somewhat submitting to the Lord. You know what I love? Obedience to God, even if it's begrudgingly, guess what? It's still obedience and he'll still use that. Amen. So not to, not to encourage people to go whining or to go arguing, but even if you do, just know that God's going to use that obedience. Um, even if you don't like it and you're trying to bring the flesh under subjection, like the Apostle Paul said, I bring my body under subjection. And I believe we should do that. Lord Jesus, teach us how to have self-discipline uh, self and a heart to obey you. Exodus 3.13, then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. 
And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel. Man, there's no greater privilege than to be an ambassador and speak on behalf of Christ. The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Everybody say forever. He, do you think he was kidding when he said that? He said, this is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. This is something to remember Christ. This is who he is. And I'm glad he said, this is my memorial. That we should remember this to all generations. Why? Because in Islam, they'll say that Jesus is a prophet. And can I say this just very bluntly? Jesus is either God in the flesh or he's a psycho crazy man. If you believe this, say amen. amen. Why? Because Jesus himself declared he was God in the flesh. When they were going back and forth and, and Jesus was telling the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, you just act like your father, the devil. And there's many things that's going in if you understand the Hebrew culture and the Hebrews way and the, the Le Levitical laws. You would see that a rabbi more than likely was, had to be like 50 years old and Jesus is in his young 30s at this time. And we have a different definition of a youth. And even an old rabbi, they could not quote or comment on a scroll or a writing unless they had the book memorized. And so for Jesus to stand up and say this, this is why one of the reasons they wanted to kill Jesus. He said, for you make yourself out to be God. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And he's saying that, hey, I'm not just a teacher. I'm not just a prophet. I'm the great I am in the flesh. It, the Bible says this through the Apostle Paul. He is the physical evidence of God. He is the full manifestation of the Father. If you believe that, say amen. Matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 John that a true, here you want a, you want a true born again question? Because Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23, Jesus red letter on white paper says that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. They will thank many people. He didn't say a few. He said many people on that day will think they're Christians and they're not. And first John gives us a 10 point test if we're truly born again. It says those who are born again can confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And Christ is not his last name. I say that because I sat for years as a young child in church and I thought Christ was literally his last name. I didn't know Christ meant the Messiah, the anointed one, God in the flesh. God came in the flesh to planet earth through Jesus Christ. And if you believe that, say amen. The Bible says you cannot sincerely admit that unless you have Holy Spirit inside you speaking from you. Amen. They said those who that deny that, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. Amen. And in, in, in church settings and in the Bible Belt, especially in a cowboy church, you might think, well, who would deny that? There is plenty. There might even be some in here today that secretly got invited, but they're, they're mocking at the same time. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And God through Moses in the Old Testament in Exodus said that this is my name and this is my memorial to you and to all generations. Why do you say to all generations? Because it is our mandate. It is our responsibility. It is our duty and our obligation as fathers, as mothers, as grandparents. To pass this on to the generations. Man, I remember when the Lord got a hold of me and I was sitting there expecting other people to read the Bible to me. I was expecting other people to preach and teach me. As I was expecting other people to pray over the food and I didn't want to. And the Lord spoke very clearly to my heart. Just one day he just said, it is your turn. It is your turn to stand up and to preach and to teach and to declare the truths of Christ. Declare the principles of the kingdom of God. And I pray that if that touched your heart just then, that's Holy Ghost telling you, you've got to pass this on to your children. You ain't got to preach a powerful sermon, but you can grab a hold of a child or a grandchild's hand and just say, I don't know, baby, but let's just pray. Jesus, would you help us? You're passing down the qualities in the kingdom of heaven, principles and the laws of the kingdom. I love that so much. So the very first memorial is God's name. There's no greater memorial than that. They even sang about it in praise and worship. Your name is power. Please turn a little few more chapters to the right to chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Hmm. 
We're going to read 14 verses. We're going to stay in Exodus for a minute this morning. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 through 14. What does the subtitle say in your Bible? The Passover instituted. If you don't realize that uh, when Moses was arguing with God to go back and to help free his people, the Israelites, and God said, I will show a strong right hand and I will deliver you. And, but Pharaoh will harden his heart and he won't want to let you go. And so God goes through 10 plagues. In the 10th plague, he said, I will kill the firstborn. I will kill the firstborn. And so we pick it up on the Passover instituted on verse 1, Exodus chapter 12. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of, of the year to you. Church, can I give you some uh, insight. And this is where I get really serious because he'll do it. God will do it. There's a difference going to Christ and asking him a question, and I hope he answers it. It might be yes, it might be no, but there's a difference when you go to God and you know he's going to answer it and you know he's going to say yes. There's a, that's a different approach. And so if you're ever sitting in church and the preacher or teacher begins to read the word of God and you start to be bored with it, you start to think about lunch, you start about thinking about the rest of the day and all these things because you're really not interested, but dare you not say that out of your mouth inside church. I pray you in that moment in your heart, you go, Lord, would you call me to fall in love with your word? Man, who answered that? I'm telling you, I don't care if you're seven or 77. If you get up and read the Bible, God has wrecked my heart. I have to listen to you. I will shut up and I will stop doing what, anything I'm doing. I got to listen to what you're reading. God will make you a lover of him. And he doesn't mash on you. He doesn't, he doesn't just condemn. He doesn't condemn you. He, his love is so powerful. It is irresistible. And I pray that just reading out of Exodus chapter 12, this might be the first time you've ever heard anybody read out of Exodus chapter 12, but know this, if you're bored with it, you don't have to be bored. Man, you can ask God and he will touch your heart and you will become a lover of his word. You'll become a lover of him and it will change your entire outlook on being a Christian. Amen. So many years I, I, I thought... You know, I'm going to go to church because I'm supposed to. And I'm going to read the Bible because I'm supposed to. And I was like, Lord, religion is terrible. Lord, would you cause me to have an actual real relationship with you? If you're heaven's husband and we're the bride of Christ, could you cause me to fall in love with you like a bride does her man? Hallelujah. He does it. He, I believe he will answer that one yes and amen every time. Matter of fact, there's somewhere in the Old Testament, I'm not sure if it's in Psalm or Job, he said, I have become to love your word more than the sustenance that I eat. Imagine that. You can get to where you want to hear God's word. You want to read God's word so much so that you'd rather have that over lunch. He'll do it. And if you sit there and go, I don't want to pray that, that sounds terrible. Everybody's scared to laugh on that one. But he, do, he will do it. You know, the Bible says, let every man be convinced. If you're not convinced by me saying it, if you're not convinced by me hollering it, then you ask him and watch. He'll cause you to fall in love with him. Amen. I love it. Verse four. And if the household is too small for the lamb, everybody say lamb. lamb. Church, I'm not trying to be preachy, but the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. In the Old Testament, it's literal. In the New Testament, it's spiritual. So as he starts talking about the lamb and the blood of the lamb, know that he's talking about Christ. Hallelujah. Types and shadow of things to come. Patterns. Next to his house, take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from without blemish, church. Did you hear that? You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. 
You might think I'm weird or my family's weird, but I took red spray paint and I sprayed it on the top of our door and on each side. Like, well, you're getting kind of weird, Jason. That's odd for God. Why would you spray paint your house? Because the Bible, the apostle Peter said, I don't say this to be tedious to you, but to remind you. I mean, raise your hand if you know you need reminders. Raise your, keep your hand up if you got some on your mirror. Amen. I love a Sharpie. You can have all kinds of reminders. It is when I come into the house, let's say anybody ever come home and you had a terrible day, raise your hand. And as I break the threshold of my house and I see that red paint, it reminds me that I'm covered by the blood of the lamb and Jesus treats me nice, tender, and sweet. And that's how the leader of the high priest of this house, I, or not the high priest, but the priest of my home, we should treat each other that way. Do we always, are we always successful? No, but it is a good reminder. I'm not telling all y'all go to Tractor Supply and Walmart and get you some red paint, but it's a good reminder. Hallelujah. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with the bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boil it at uh, all with water, but roast, roast it in fire. Its head with its legs and entrails you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it. With a belt on your waist and your sandals and on your feet and your staff in your hand. Why? He says, once you do this, you need to be ready to go. Everybody say amen. amen. Once you get born again and covered by the blood of Jesus, you need to get ready to go. He's got to work for you. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 2, he says you were saved for good works. What? Beforehand. He has work for us to do. I, I sincerely believe this with everything in me. You cannot work your way to salvation, but once you get truly saved, you will get to work. Whether it be small or great, you're going to, you, you won't be able to help it. Verse 11, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, sandals and your feet, and your staff in your hands, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, not just the firstborn of humans, but the firstborn of animals. And against all the gods of Egypt, and I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign. Everybody, everybody say sign. That's going to come up here in the next set of scriptures, what the Antichrist is already doing today. For you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day, here it is, verse 14, shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. If you believe that, say amen. amen. If you've never attended a Passover meal where they actually follow the old uh, law, not to be saved and not to keep your salvation, just to honor the Lord. Uh, they do it in honor. It is a very wonderful experience. Um, Fast forward to New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is, um, institutes the Lord's Supper. Not institutes, but he, he establishes the Lord's Supper, and he says these words. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So one of our memorials is one of the two ordinances of the church. One of the ordinances of the church is baptism. The second one is Holy Communion. So when we have communion, that is a memorial that God told us to keep. And let me say this, because religion is sneaky. Religion can just sneak up on you and you feel satisfied with a religious act and never really participated in it in the manner which God wanted you to. So when he says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And I'm just going to kind of go down what I remember when I take, while it's being passed out and before I take it and after I take it. I was born again when I was 13 years old and I remember walking the aisle crying. So... Before I take the bread, I immediately, it's as if I turned into a 13-year-old boy again. And I didn't know what anointing was. I didn't know what evangelist was. I didn't know. All I know is this guy kept saying, what are you going to do about this man named Jesus? And he says, if you confess him, praise be to God. If you don't confess him, you're denying him. If you keep silent, you're denying him. And so all these things start to go over before I take this bread. And I'm sitting there reminded that I just walked down this aisle crying. And then I start to think about, you know, Jesus didn't just cry. Can I be very blunt and y'all not be offended and y'all just hear me out? Christ died a horrible death. Nobody walked up to him and just blew his head off. That man was, he was accused in front of the Sanhedrin. He was mocked. 
He was spit on. His beard was ripped out. The Bible would say, man, I got afraid. The first time I read this, when I was serious about Jesus, I got afraid for the man that is spoken about in the Gospels. It says that, and it doesn't say the man's name, but it says that somebody slapped Jesus and said, prophesy who hit you. You imagine slapping God in the flesh and then mocking him. So he went through that, and then, and then he was made to carry it. He went through the flogging, right? Cowboy church, raise your hand if you ever got a whooping with a belt. I, and I'm not into child abuse. Obviously, I'm a pastor, but discipline's there. But can you imagine being whooped with a cat of nine tails that rips out flesh 39 times? Because it was Roman culture, it was Roman tradition, that as the flogger hits you the 40th time and you didn't die, it's his turn to die. So they backed it off one stripe. The Apostle Paul experienced this. And, and, and people, when we see the movie The Passion, more than likely, this occurred to him while he was naked. You imagine being naked in front of everybody, being ridiculed and mocked and made fun of and spit on and beard ripped out and a crown of thorns. And that's not coincidence, church. He said, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might not die. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And what was the curse of the earth when Adam and Eve sinned? One of the punishments said, cursed is the ground for your sakes. The thorns and thistles will grow. Thorns is an evidence of sin. And they put it, the kingdom of darkness didn't even realize what they were doing. They put the crown of thorns on the, on the king of kings, mocking him, saying he's the king of sin when he knew no sin at all. And then it whooped him, hit him in the head with a reed, and then they made him carry his own cross. That could be up to 250 to 300 pounds. I'm, I'm sure there's some strong guys in here, but imagine carrying that. Have you ever tried to carry a backpack or something after a bad sunburn? Imagine being whooped and flogged and then carried, your, carried the cross that he didn't deserve all the way to Calvary. And then to put nails in his hands and nails in his feet and a pierce in his side. Six hours, we get the word excruciating pain from the word crucifixion. And so then your Lord and Savior, King and Master, mine as well, hung on the cross for six hours. That's not coincidence because man was made on the sixth day. God is a redempting God. He's redeeming everything from the cross and the blood of Jesus. And six hours, three hours of darkness, three hours of night, and three of the hours, both, both imagine they're nailed to the cross and both thieves are now making fun of Christ. And then somewhere along the way, one of the thieves had a revelation and said, you know what? Our reward is just. Our penalty is just, but this man has done no wrong. It's almost as if this thief started yelling at the other thief over there, stop making fun of him. We deserve this. He's done nothing wrong. I mean, you know, that's the gospel. When you have this revelation that Jesus did nothing wrong and we deserve our penalty, that's the true gospel and revelation that we need Christ. And he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, don't forget about me. He said, surely this day you'll be with me in paradise. And then raised, he went down to, hey, man, there's so much to say, but do this in remembrance of me. I pray that communion is never a religious act where we feel good about ourselves, but we actually do remember what our king went through. It was not an easy death. Matter of fact, he was so afraid of it, he sweat, he sweat blood. That's how much he didn't want to go do it. He said, that's where you get the term, not my will, but yours, Father. If you believe that, say Amen. Communion, the Lord's Passover, is a memorial. Please turn to Exodus 13, one page over probably. I'm going to switch gears real quick. Switch channels or something. Because you'd sit there and say, we're going to start at verse 3. You'd say, why is the Feast of Unleavened Bread a memorial? Or what they do within it, a memorial. And I'm not very good at explaining this, um, so I'll pray y'all show me grace but before I read it, I want you to put your thinking cap on or ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation of what the Antichrist will do. The Antichrist must convince at least two world religions, the Jews and Muslims, they believe their Messiah is not here yet. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They're still waiting on their Messiah. So this Messiah must convince people who live by the law and people who live by the Quran. And so as we read this, I'm going to ask a question when I'm done reading it to see if we know the answer. But somewhere else in the Bible, hint, New Testament, this is talked about. And we have not seen it yet, but we're close. Okay? Exodus chapter 13, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verse 3. And Moses said to the people, 
Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. Has anybody testify that God brought you out of a place? My goodness. Whether it was psychological, mental, spiritual, physical, God knows how to rescue people. Hallelujah. He is very good at it. Once he shows up, can't no demon in hell touch or fight him or resist him. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Verse 4, on this day you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son, did you hear that, church? What we learn about Christ, what we learn about the Bible, we should pass on to our children. You shall tell, shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from out of Egypt. What do you tell your children? You give them your testimony. Your children and your family should be the first people who hear your testimony. Amen? Amen. It shall be a sign. Everybody say sign. sign. Here it is. It shall be a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. That the Lord's law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. You'll see sometimes a Hebrew will have something on their hand and then a strap with a, a square with like scriptures in it between their eyes. Where is that going to happen in the New Testament? Your right hand and your forehead. Book of Revelation. He'll cause. Who's that? Who's he? Antichrist. He'll cause all small and great, rich or poor, slave or free to receive a mark. And without this mark, you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. Don't raise your hand. Maybe just answer in your heart when I ask you this. But I would hear that a preacher growing up hearing that, and I would think, that's way down the road. There's no way that's going to happen in my generation. That'll probably happen to my grandkids. My grandkids, I need to pray for my kids and grandkids because that's probably what they're going to face. There's a local store in North Texas right now. You know how you can pay for your food? With your hand. And this might, y'all may be like, Jason, where you been? That's been around for a minute. I don't, I, this first I heard of it two or three days ago. A local North Texas store, you can... When you go up to this machine, you put your hand in it, and guess what? how it recognizes you for you? And then when it recognizes you, it's tied to your debit card or your credit card, whatever card you set up on the account. Guess what it identifies with your hand? Vein patterns. Okay, church, are you listening to this? Your blood is purchasing. The pattern of your blood is uniquely tied to a debit card that now helps you buy your groceries. Did y'all hear that? It is setting the stage for the Antichrist to put the mark in the right hand or the forehead. You know why it's probably going to go to the forehead? Because thieves are sadistic, and they'll probably cut people's hands off just to get something. But they're probably not too keen. They, you know, the thief is a thief is a thief. But they probably won't cut your head off for it. Amen. Did I just get on the weird channel for all y'all? This is police and military radar popping off, but it's already happening. It's already happening, and it's happening in your precious, our precious North Texas. There's all kinds of memorials. Uh, no way we can go over it all in one sermon. Blowing of trumpets on the Sabbath, the Bible says, as a memorial. Do you realize that act? The Lord goes like this. I see that. Mark it down. Church, if we believe that God is an accurate God and he keeps very good track record, not because shame, shame, shame on you, even though he can do that as well, but to his children, to his bride, he can see everything you've ever done in honor of him. That's beautiful. And whether you like this or not, it's in the Old Testament and New Testament. I'll prove it before the message is over. Your money and how you spend it is a memorial up to God. 
certain ways how you spend or you handle your money, the Bible says, we don't have the time to go into all the scriptures, it says that, that how you spent that money is a memorial up to God immediately. Hallelujah. Certain sacrifices, most of the ones that are burnt offerings are a memorial to God. Did you realize your prayers are a memorial to God? So stop listening to the negative, unclean spirit that might be mocking you or making fun of you. Are you really good at self-negative talk? Quit saying that God's so busy in the Middle East. Quit thinking that, you know what, God, um, you know, I'll be fine. You, you, you got enough problems of your own. You can go handle other people. Stop that. If you're a child of God, raise your hand. When you pray, they don't stop at the ceiling. God hears them and your prayers go up as a memorial. It means God says, I heard that, I saw that, and I will remember that. That is powerful. Um, another one is when the priest, the high priest, would go in before the Holy of Holies um, to minister to the Lord once a year after the blood of the Lamb was sacrificed. On his ephod, or his shoulders, were six sons of Israel, six sons of Israel. So the weight of the children of Israel was on the shoulders of the priest, right? As a remembrance to the Lord, always remembering the sons of Israel. Amen? Why, why would they, why is it, why, Jason, you're getting into the boring stuff of the Bible. No, because sometimes if you feel like you got a lot of weight on your shoulders, that's evidence that there's something you're not giving to God. Give it to God. He's the only one that can handle it. And one of my favorites, please turn to Malachi chapter 3. It's the last book of the Old Testament. In between Malachi and Matthew, how many years of silence? 400. Y'all did good. First service, didn't they? I know sometimes I wear people out in church. I'm not, it's not my goal to wear you out. It's my goal to... Max, in Jesus' name, to maximize teaching, to maximize preaching, to maximize the, the, the amount of blessings you will receive. And so when you agree with God's word, you will receive a blessing. You can't stop it. God will bless you. So real quick, raise your hand if you fear the Lord. It is good to have a healthy reverence for God. It says the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Here you go. To love God is to hate evil. Amen. So if you fear the Lord, guess what God just had probably more than likely an angel write down in a book. Let's read Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. The subtitle says, A Book of Remembrance. There's a 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. But did you realize of the 66 books, some of these books talk about other books we've never seen. Anybody in here seen the book of life? Nope. But I hope our name's written in it. Amen. If you're born again, your name is written in it. Malachi 3, 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Listen to this, church. And the Lord listened and heard them. <laughs> I'm laughing because I used to not think that God did that. It's so stupid. It's so dumb. But I actually thought that like God really pays attention to you in church. Like if you're rude to somebody while they were getting coffee and a donut, God saw that. Right? I, it was so dumb to think this, but God hears. He, matter of fact, he's so good at listening to conversations, he can hear your thoughts. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament it says, he who made the ear, can he not hear? He who made the tongue, can he not speak? Amen. So those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him, capital H, for those who fear the Lord. I not only want to be in the book of life, I want to be in the book of remembrance. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. Hallelujah. You're precious in the sight of God. That's not preachy. That's truth and it's scriptural. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. I pray you're in the first one. Amen. Please turn to Acts chapter 10. This set of scriptures and another set of scriptures. And then uh, the Lord showed me how to conclude it. I uh, pray it blesses you. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. Cornelius sends a delegation. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, book of Acts, fifth book of the New Testament, chapter 10, verse 1. Cornelius sends a delegation. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. If that was equated to the United States military, you're talking about a man It's either equivalent to a full bird colonel or a one-star general. So a pretty high-level man. A devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour, that's about 3 p.m. of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, are, am I reading now the New Testament right now? So people can have visions today. Angels are not in... The, <laughs> angels don't stop working for God because of our lack of belief. They are still sent on assignments. Here's your prayer that I heard one day, and I was like, I'm stealing that prayer. Heard a guy say one time, Lord, if you got any angels in this area that don't have an assignment, send them to me. Make, make our homes, our businesses, our vehicles an, an angelic hub. Like, Lord, if they ain't got nothing to do, send them here and just may, may it look like in the spirit, my family, my marriage, my home, my businesses, everything, the church, everything, would you send so many angels that the demons, when they come by wherever I own supervisor steward, they go, leave that alone. That would cost us way too many resources to even mess with them. If you believe this, say amen. I think, I think we've gotten very... Um, not, not condemning, just, and I put myself in this boat as well. I think one of the most devastating prayers that shut us down as little boys and girls was, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Amen. Beautiful prayer, but guess what? God didn't want us to stop there. You, do you realize there's prayers that God wants you to say that you don't even know yet? Come on, this can get really good. It can get really good. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly, hallelujah, in a vision, an angel of God coming in saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? He was afraid. This is a devout, powerful man. He don't get, that means translation, in the military. That means he don't get scared that easy. So when God's soldiers show up, my goodness, look out. It'll be a humbling reminder how weak the flesh really is. So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Your prayers and your alms, your money has come up. Your gifts have come up as a, God says, I see you praying. I heard you praying. I remember you praying. I see what you're doing with that. I, and and, and he, he remembers it. He said it right there. The angel sent it to him, said it to him. So he said to him, your prayers, your alms, you have come up for a memorial before God. Now send me to Joppa and send for Simon, for whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Hall Woo! Guys, there is things we must do. Must do. It's not Christ saying, would you please, when you feel like it, would you come on, just do one little thing? There is some things God says you must do it. Hallelujah. And he's not going to tell you you must do something and not give you the strength and wisdom and the understanding know-how on how to apply it to your life or how to give somebody a message. He will do it. He does it every time. God will do it. If you believe God will do it, say amen. amen. And when verse 7, and when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants a, and a devout soldier, hallelujah for devout soldiers, from among those who waited on him continually, so when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Hallelujah. A memorial. Alms, alms and prayers. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 14. My last scripture. Matthew, Mark. Right after Matthew is Mark chapter 14. Ladies, sometimes, if I was going to be honest, I get jealous of what God did with you in the Bible. He does some unique, beautiful things with y'all. He does it with everybody, but there's just some stories that have really got my attention. Mark 14. But I don't think it's coincidence that the bride of Christ, that the church is symbolic to a woman. Amen? Amen. Makes us dudes kind of weirded out, but through the Holy Spirit will uh, make that transition. Amen? Help us understand it. Mark 14. 
Here's your one. Um, helps me understand it, so that's not a weird statement, especially this generation. People are like, I don't know what the preacher just said there. The time I cry the most is when I'm preaching. Uh, ladies, not only scripturally, but it's known more common. Now, there's a every once in a while this is rare that it, for it to be switched, but more than likely the women are more emotional than the men. Uh, matter of fact, women sometimes can get very angry at the man because they think they don't care because they don't get emotional like they do. The number one time I get emotional is when I'm acting as a bride of Christ, reading and preaching God's word as the church. I don't think that's coincidence. He will make your heart tender. This is what makes many men not want to come to church because when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, it's just like you, especially if you're not a crier, you don't like that at first. You'll fight it. You're like, this is, I had a guy, guys, a knuckle dragon, silverback gorilla contractor from the Middle East. Lost count. I'm not trying to be prideful or haughty right now. I'm trying to make a point. This guy has done some crazy, dangerous things multiple times for multiple years. Not just he had one really cool story. He's got all kinds of stories, right? And he, he said, he called me one time and said, I used to secretly make fun of you because I try to listen to your messages because we were friends, but you keep crying. And I was like, I can't put up with this. And I just turn it off. I'm not watching YouTube. You crying all the time. And he said, but and he got quiet on the phone. I got born again, and I called you to ask you, when is this going to stop? <laughs> and I said, you had better pray it don't ever stop. It is good to have a tender heart. Amen. Don't care. Some of the most. Matter of fact, Cowboy Church, I'm going to say this and I get back to Scripture. Have you ever seen a really big guy start crying right before he gets in a fight? If you see somebody crying before he fights, you better leave him alone. Everybody just get in your truck and leave. Go to Dairy Queen and get him a burger. Amen. No amens. Back to you, ladies. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 14, the anointing at Bethany, verse 3, 3 through 9. I love this. And beginning in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper... As he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Man, I'm telling you, when you ladies are convinced to do something for the Lord, y'all are all in. I love it. Amen. Mind you, only one man showed up at Calvary. They were close to Jesus. All the rest were ladies. Yeah. Praise God for you ladies. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Can I just say this bluntly? If you do something for the Lord, somebody will have a problem with you and they'll tell you why you shouldn't have done it. Amen. Same then, same today. Verse 5, for it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Sometimes when you're criticized sharply, you're smack dab in the middle of God's will. And that doesn't sit well with your flesh, but sometimes it is true. Verse 6, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. Did you hear that, church? It doesn't have to be something big and powerful. You ready, church? Do what you can. Amen? Amen? Just do what you can. And that's good. Do what you can. She has come before, beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever, everybody say wherever. wherever. Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. God honors people. God honors people. He says, look what they did. And, and guys, not to be funny, but my Bible is a study Bible. Anybody raise your hand if you got a study Bible? Can I give you cheater notes at the bottom? Amen. Don't be afraid of those. And down at the, at the bottom of my Bible, it says, The influence of an act of service for Christ, if not its memory, will not end. It echoes into eternity. Amen. A service for Christ. And this is where the Lord stopped me. That headstone is blank for a reason. Um, I didn't realize it when 
they sent it to me, but I realized it once the Lord showed it to me. That represents all of our gravestones, every one of us. We don't know the date, but when your gravestone is placed on your grave, what will people remember you for? When they come to your memorial service, what will the preacher say? What will your friends and family say? Amen? It's appointed unto die once and then the judgment. Absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. When you take your last breath here on earth and you face to face to Christ Jesus, the Lord of Lord and kings of kings, the great I am, the ancient of days, face to face, what will he say to you? Will you say, well done, not good and faithful servant? I'm not trying to guilt nobody into service. This is a scriptural, spiritual reality that we must all face. I pray that we're all born again. And we can, and you know, sometimes you hear a preacher say that, but what can we do? First off, don't, this is religion. You hear and get inspired by a message. You leave the church trying to work hard and do great things for Jesus. That's religion. Relationship would be pause. Don't just leave so fast and say, Jesus, what is my service to you? Whether it be small or great, what do you want me to do? What can I do? He said, she did what she could. Isn't that beautiful? She did what she could. So what could you do? Locally, I'm, I'm not so upset with local schools, but we all have seen some videos of some school boards that have lost their mind. Amen? Amen? And I, I had this misconception. I, I thought you could only go to a school board meeting of where you live. You can actually go to other school boards if you hear other things, especially... Um, when your family starts to get big and most, many of your family members live in other school districts, you can sign up, be respectful, be honoring, and go say something to the school board. There's a preacher, if you've seen his videos, he's powerful. And with respect and honor, he lights these people up, lights them up on what they're allowing in the libraries, what they're teaching. And he says, God told me to raise up 400 school board warriors that will stand on behalf of the children who cannot speak for themselves. Amen. Or for the parents who are too shy or afraid to speak up for their, for their children. So you, maybe you could do that. Different ministries. Um, guys, um, that local store um, that does that hand scanning, this is what the Lord's already put on my heart, is just to go talk to that manager. And most people want to say they're a Christian, and I'll say, can I just real gently... Just say, this is not the mark of the beast, but you're setting the stage for it. And so if we read this Bible, we know, Jason, who, in some ways, people don't want to verbalize this because they would sound very non-Christian. But they almost, their hearts say, who cares? The Bible says it's coming anyway. So why don't we just get ready for it? I believe the Lord wants us. He said, occupy until I return. I believe one of the mandates and duties and obligations of a Christian is hold the line as long as possible. You hold the line as long as possible so that what? Souls can be saved. That's the only reason why Christ hadn't come back yet. He says, and when the gospel is preached to the ends of the earth, then he will return. Amen. He gives everybody a chance to accept Christ. What about state? There is a, I seen this video on YouTube and it made me so happy. There is a ministry down on the border where they're just letting folks in, right? All across the country, all across the world, letting people in across the border. And there's a minister, the Lord said, go down there and preach to them as they're crossing. They're literally having a revival down on the border and said already 300 souls have been saved for people crossing the border. Amen? Hallelujah. We can do that. You can go down there and feed and give, just be a, a logistical blessing to the soldiers and the, and the law enforcement that are down there. Uh, at a state level, I believe more Christians should be in politics. And I believe there's people that the Lord has told you to run for something. And one, you don't want to get into the garbage of politics. Or two, you don't feel like you're adequate enough. You are adequate enough. If Holy Spirit's telling you, it means he's anointed you for such a time as this. And you need to get up and at least try. Amen. We need, if you believe we need more godly people in politics, say amen. Amen, amen. amen. At the national level, uh, ladies, especially you mamas, listen to this. The Don't Mess With Our, Our Kids movement, organization. In October of this year, they're striving to have one million women walking in D.C. with Don't Mess With Our Kids. Amen. Get your hotel room now. Seriously. Well, let's just see what happens. Um, get your hotel room now. 
and uh, get involved with that organization. We're going to support that organization in some form or fashion and get up there and represent. Matter of fact, imagine you as a young mama or a grandma or a great grandma saying that you could tell 10, 20, 30 years from now, I was there when two million, I believe it'll be a lot more than a million, when two million mamas showed up and said, you're, you're done messing with our kids. You're not going to do it anymore. Hallelujah. Or at the world. Sometimes people are called to the world level and obviously continue to pray for Israel. I think we should do that even when they're not at war. We should pray for them anyway. But guess who is meeting tomorrow? This is my last part and I will close. Guess who is meeting tomorrow in Geneva, Switzerland? Raise your hand if you know what the WHO is. World Health Organization. They are meeting. They've already been meeting for awards and different things and executive um, meetings and stuff like that. But they start their main meeting on discussions. One of the discussions they're going to have not just tomorrow, but throughout the week. While everybody is barbecuing, having a good time, which you should have a good time, I pray you pray for the families who lost soldiers, but we should enjoy our freedom. But while we're doing that tomorrow, know this, that they're trying to define what a pandemic is. And once they have a pandemic, I read for like two hours last night on a PDF form, it's about 21 to 23 pages, on specifically paramilitary coming out of country, into country, to stop certain people and shut them down for doing certain things. Well, during COVID, guess what? All the legislation's caught up to where they can't mess with the house of faith anymore, right? But now it says, and it's like on page 18, in one little section, in one sentence, it says, with the nation's permission, we will come in and enforce for them. That's what they said. I'm not trying to fear monger. I'm not trying to make everybody leave and be angry while they go to Chili's and Dairy Queen. But I'm saying we should pray about it. Amen. And we should be talking to our local officials and say, hey, if that's true, one, the United States, the word sovereignty is sovereignty for a reason. But they said as long as they had permission from the nation. So the nation, the current administration can say, you now have permission to come in and enforce for us so we don't look like the bad guy. Amen. So my point is this. There's something for all of us to do. Amen. At minimum, wake up a little early and pray. At minimum. And quit, quit thinking that prayer is just, a, oh, yeah, I pray. Prayer is powerful. Amen. It's a memorial before the Lord. Can we stand, please? And then I was thinking to the Lord, I was, Lord, how do I conclude this? And I heard this scripture in my mind. You can do all these things and have not love, and it profits you nothing. You can be busy in religion. You can be busy in church and ministries and local, all, everything. And if you don't know Christ, it's all for nothing. I can't say it enough. You must know Jesus Christ to be born again. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And let's make sure we're not Lord, Lord Christians, where we think we're saved and we're really not. Amen? Amen. Father, you know who is saved and who is lost. Lord, we just pray ahead of time for all these ladies that will go to D.C., for the don't mess with our kids. Lord, I, I think that sounds like you. Don't mess with my children. Lord, you said it is better, better for a millstone to be wrapped around your neck and cast into the sea than you cause one of these little ones to stumble. And so, Lord, I pray that these million, two million, however many million women and mamas you want to send to D.C., Lord, I pray that they remove a lot of millstones that were going to be around people's necks because they're there supporting their babies. And Lord, I thank you ahead of time for protecting them. Your word says that you give us a promise, you go before us. And Lord, would you just speak to all of our hearts and just convince us and persuade us? What, what do you want us to do as a memorial to you? And Lord, lastly, I pray that you bless the families who have lost loved ones. And Lord, may we all pause. We say that. We hear preachers and churches and people say that. But Lord, may the leaders of families tomorrow, wherever they group or assemble or fellowship, break bread, have a drink, Lord, may they just pause and pray for those families. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you want a blessing, hold out your hands, please. Band and ministers, please come. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. May God bless y'all. We love you. If you need prayer, please come.